Now let's look at structural design in VHDL. And the term structural design refers to where you are going to connect other subsystems together in order to create the functionality that you want. So we talked about components before is the way that VHDL uh, declares other VHDL files for inclusion. So if we had a system, for example, where we wanted to create a system where its functionality was nothing more than the connection of lower level systems, what we would have to do is we would have to first declare what these systems were, and then when we go to use them, we do something called instantiation. And instantiation can be done numerous times. It can be do, done once, it can be done a million times, but the instantiation is where we actually put these subsystems down into our design, and then we need to connect them accordingly. So we have this notion of what we call port mapping. So when we say structural design, what we're really talking about is instantiating other VHDL systems into a higher level system in order to accomplish functionality. Okay, so the way that you instantiate something is as follows. So remember that we come along and we say, okay, architecture, and then we have the begin statement. And up here, we are going to declare, this is where we declare the component. And then down here, we're going to instantiate it. So after the begin statement, the syntax is as follows. What you do is you put a instance name. Okay, so this is an instance name. And this is something that you make up. And then you put a colon, and then you put the component name, and the component name has to match exactly what was in the declaration. And then what you do is you do a keyword port map, port map, port map, and then you do the port connections. And then within this port connections, there's two, way to do, two ways to do the port mapping. Okay? And we'll, let me just describe it really briefly, and then the best way to learn it is to look at an example. So there's two ways to do it. You can do explicit, and you can do positional. And the way that it works is in explicit, what you do is you actually list, you're gonna list what the port name is. So you'll do a port name, and that's the port of the lower level component. And then you do this connection operator, which is equal and then greater sign, and then you put the signal in the higher level system of what it is. So for example, if you had a port that was called A here, and this was called N1, you would come over here and the port would be A gets connected to N1. So that would be the, the syntax there, assuming N1 was an internal node. Positional is where, depending on the way, or the connections are made by simply listing out in order all of the signals in the top level, so SIG1, SIG2, SIG3, and you list them all out in, in the order, and they're connected in the order that the ports were declared in the component declaration. So this one takes less syntax, but you gotta be careful of which order they're in. Okay, so the best way to learn this is to look at an example. So let's just take an example where we're going to build the exact same truth table uh, that we looked at when we did concurrent signal assignments with logical operators, where we looked at conditional signal assignments and selected signal assignments. So let's say we had this truth table, and we are going to build this circuit, so inverters, ands, and an or, but we're gonna do it where instead of using operators for these logic operators, or these logical gates, we're actually gonna declare three components that have already been designed. So let's say, for example, that we had three other designs that we either created or we bought from somebody or somebody else created for us. And these are what the lower level entities look like. So for example, we had an inverter which was called INV1 and it's got the port definition of A and F are its ports. Then you have AND3, the three representing that it's got a fan in of three. And then you have ABC and F are its declaration or its ports. And then we have an OR3. 
So A, B, C, and F again. And let's instantiate these into a higher level file in order to create this functionality. Now, we're assuming that the inverter actually does the inversion. This is a three input and operation, and this is the three input or operation. Uh, and we can just make that assumption. So let's take a look at how this goes. So the first thing that we want to do is let's create the entity for our system. And let's just call it system X. So we come along, entity system X, A, B, C, and F. And this is, we're creating this true table right here. Now what we're going to do is we start the architecture. Architecture system X arc of system X. Notice this is, I just made that up. This is tying it to that entity. And then we come down here and it's time to do our declarations. Well, when we do this, we also need internal signals. So let's do our signal declarations first. So we're going to have A and B and C N, and we're going to have M0, M2, and M6. So we declare those using signal declarations. Then we need to declare our components. So we need to tell this level that these three subsystems exist and that what their names is and what the exact port definition is. So let's take a look at declaring the first component. So look at this. We're going to say keyword component INV1. Notice it matches this exactly. Then we list out the port definition of that lower level component. And it is identical to the port definition in the lower level entity. In fact, when you do this, you almost always copy and paste this so that you don't make a mistake. So, but this, then we say end component. So now what I've told this VHDL file is that I, there is something out here called INV1. Its ports are like this, and I'm going to use it as a component. I might use it a million times, I might use it just once, but I'm going to use it. Then let's continue. Let's do the AND declaration. So same thing, component AND3, and then you give the ports. And then finally, let's do the OR. So then, so that's going to be component OR3. So what I've done is I've declared my three components that I'm going to use, and I'm ready to start modeling behavior. Okay. So what's left is I need to instantiate these and port map them. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to give a unique instance name. And the reason you need an instance name is because we might use this inverter more than once. And in fact, we will use it more than once. We're going to use it three times. I'm going to use the keyword port map. Notice you can put it all on one line or you can wrap lines. It's, it doesn't matter. It, it is all understood until it gets to the semicolon. The semicolon and ends this line of code. So then I say, I'm going to use explicit port mapping. Notice that I listed the port name of the inverter, and then I listed the signal name in my entity, or in my top level. This is the port name. F is the port name of the inverter. AN is the signal name of my top level. So let's see if I can get that on the screen. I'm gonna, we're really interested in this right here. So notice that this right here was the port of the lower level. And this right here was the signal in the higher level. So that's how you do the explicit port mapping. All right. Now explicit port mapping, you don't have to have these in any particular order because it's so explicit. But it, it's the safest way to do it, although it does take a little bit of extra syntax. OK, so now let's look at three of these inverters. Now this really illustrates how we needed that instance name. So I just said U1, U2, and U3. And that's to give unique identifications to these three subsystems that we instantiated, or these three components. Notice that I hooked them up. I had A, B, and C as the signals coming into my three inverters. And then I had A and B and C and. But look at how the ports were always A and always F. And that's because that's what the ports were at that lower level instance. OK, so I've got my three inverters. And now I'm ready to do three AND gates. So take a look at these AND gates. I have my instance name. I just called it U4, U5, and U6. AND3, which was the name of the component. Then I had port map, and I did explicit port mapping again. So this is where I had to actually connect it correctly. And the outputs were connected to M0, M2, and M6. And then finally, I need to instantiate one OR gate. So I, I just called it U7. And I said OR3, port map. And then I just connected these three signals together, M0, M2, and M6. And the output was F to F. So this was the lower level port name of the OR3. And this was the signal name of what was at the top level, which was F, which actually was the port output of the entire thing. And I'm done. So this right here, if you look at that, this right here 
is a structural implementation of this logic circuit. Now this is, a, it's an example, okay? You, you would rarely do this with basic gates, but it's to illustrate how you instantiate these lower level components and you do the wiring. Again, this is explicit port mapping. If we wanted to look at positional port mapping for that exact same example, all we would do is here, here is the explicit port mapping that we just had in that example. Here's what it would look like as positional port mapping. So I excluded the lower level port name from it and I just had to put the signal name of the upper level instant or the upper, upper level signals in order. So it was implied that A was connected to the first port declared on the lower level instance. Now this is dangerous because when you get a large signal list here, sometimes you can accidentally put them in the wrong order and it'll, it's very difficult to debug. So in general, safe design is to use explicit port mapping, but this can be, for really small ones, you can use this to kind of speed up or reduce the complexity of, of the design. So that is structural design using components. And one last comment on this is this is considered concurrent because each of these components are treated as if they are independent, parallel, executed subsystems. So this is actually officially, at this level, it's concurrent. Now, who, we don't know what's beneath it. The b behavior beneath it might not be concurrent. In this example, it of course was. However, these are all treated as concurrent executed components.